I'll begin my message with this. Before we even open scripture, tonight's topic is My God is Real. Who here is in college right now or has been in college? Just keep your hands up, okay? All right, Every, all right, just keep your hand up for now. Now, who here had to take a world religions class or a philosophy class? Keep your hands up. Everybody put your hands down. Okay, so maybe, maybe 25, 30%, okay? Okay. I had to take both of those my junior year of college, if I remember correctly. Uh, good old JMU on the East Coast, great, great liberal arts school. But that semester was probably the toughest semester for me in my spiritual walk before God. I came in as a believer, and over the course of the semester, everything I believed about God was broken down. Everything I thought I knew about God was destroyed, and it left me with a feeling of, why is God even real? Who is God? Is Christianity even the right religion? Is religion even an answer? Let me ask you right now, and this is a, a two-way dialogue. Why believe in God? Is God real, and what proof do we have? Can somebody answer me that? Give me, give me an answer. Somebody. He answers prayers? He answers prayers? I absolutely agree with that. But I'm an unbeliever, so I don't see him working in my life. That's not an answer for me, you know? Maybe you're just making that up. I don't know. Give me another one. Creation. creation? Okay. But did you see creation? I mean, can you show me? Can you prove that to me? He changes lives. He changes lives. Uh, I agree with that. Um, lives do get changed, but maybe it's just psychological. Work of Say again. Miracles, yeah, uh, man, and those are hard to deny. I really don't know, but you know what? I, I've never been in church. I've never seen a miracle happen, so I don't know. Scripture, Scripture? but I, yeah, it's just Bible, it, that old book. Who believes in that? You know, it's just words some old guys wrote on a piece of paper. You know, the, the Bible is historically proven. Yeah, really, though, I don't know if I believe the guys that try to prove that. Archaeology, yeah, but you Christians are, yeah, you guys are a crazy bunch, man, making up archaeological facts. What is the proof he isn't real? Uh, well, that's a terrific question. The idea behind it is, uh, you know, in, in our philosophy class, when we discussed it, if you look at it logically, there is no proof logically that you can construct without any fallacy that God exists, but there is also no proof that he doesn't exist. So in reality, I don't know. I, is, is he real? Is he not real? I don't know. Take a leap of faith. Take a leap. <laughs> I love it, man. Moses is a closer. <laughs> He's going to make me a believer. I love it. Um, folks, I, I don't want, well, no, I do want, I want you to question your faith tonight. I think if you don't question your faith, um, you're not going to understand what's going on here. A lot of us as Christians have been kind of just believing by inertia. Our parents are believing, you know, our friend, we, we're just here for, and, and we don't even think about, yeah, it, it, but is God real? Why do I believe in God? Is he even real? They had a, uh, there was a story of a, what's called a biosphere, which was an enclosed environment. Uh, and they, it was supposed to be self-sustaining. It was supposed to be an example of what would happen in, in Mars. If there was a colony on Mars, um, what, it, what it would look like. And they found something very interesting. They said the trees, everything seemed to be right, but the trees on the biosphere, they died early. They, as they would grow, they would just fall apart. They couldn't stand on their own. The reason they found out later was very interesting. They said if there was no wind to blow the trees, they wouldn't develop what's called stress wood, which is kind of the, the, the hard part of the tree that helps them stand up because there's nothing to stress them, and so they would just fall as they got bigger. I'm going to stress you guys tonight, all right? I want you guys to think a little bit. 
Some of you will walk out of here and you might become an atheist tonight, and so be it. But I hope the rest of you guys will believe and understand what we're talking about here, okay? If the pastors like run out and tackle me right now, <laughs> um, it is what it is. Let's begin with this. Genesis 1.1, I'm going to read you literally five words, actually four words, there's a comma there. Uh, before we get to that, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. The first question is, is there a God? And the question that lies behind, is there a God, is this. Did God create man or did man create God? Are you guys with me? Did God create us or did man or is God a figment of our imagination? That's the question we're going to answer today. So I'll begin with this. And this is a very, very, um, you guys have probably seen this in, in maybe other sermons. Or maybe you haven't. But I want to make sure we put this out there. And we, we're going to study through this. And we're going to call things as they are. There are five worldviews on God today. And gentlemen, please uh, show us the, that slide. Five worldviews on God today. We're going to talk about each because it's important we understand what's, what's out there and the consequence of each of these. And so the first worldview on God today is is naturalism slash atheist slash agnostic. Now, an atheist or an agnostic believes the following, that there is no God, there is no soul, there is no spirit. Man is a chance product of evolution. We're just a collection of atoms that will one day be wiped out. There is no such thing as the spiritual world. Values and morals are subjective. Meaning, what you think is right may be right. What I think is right may be right. There's really no way to tell. Uh, it's, it's just whatever socially acceptable and socially acceptable behaviors change. So whatever we think is right is right. There's no standard moral values. Life is all you have. It really has no meaning because you're going to be wiped out shortly anyway. Barely any meaning at all because it was an accident. There is no God to help you. There are no real morals or values you can rely on. Life becomes chaos and leads to despair. That's the word I want you to remember with naturalism and atheism. It leads to despair because there's really no hope. If it hurts, the only way out is suicide. Because seriously, if your life has no meaning, why would you keep living? Just kill yourself. I mean, it's just a collection of atoms. There's no God waiting for you on the other side. There's no life waiting for you on the other side. Just kill yourself. Your only purpose in life is for your brain just to release positive hormones, just little atoms for the rest of your atoms, just for you to feel good. That's it. There is no meaning it's chaos. It's despair. You mean nothing. Do they teach you that in school? Do they say that? Do they position atheism that way? No? I wonder why. You know? I wonder why atheists don't have songs, you know? <laughs> we all might as well be dead, you know? Man, it's, it's a bleak view on life. It's a bleak view on life. Now, there's deism, there's deism, well, that includes polytheism, that includes all the ancient religions, if you think about the Greco-Roman religions and gods, if you think about maybe the, uh, the Mayan and the Aztec civilizations, maybe the Babylonian, the Egyptian, where they had multiple, multiple gods, pantheons of gods that ruled over everything. A lot of tribes that we discover, right, all of them have, they're, they're polytheistic, they're deistic. What this means is the world they believe is populated by spirits, and they govern everything that goes on. Gods and demons are the real reason behind natural disasters, natural events, and they're often attached to physical objects, right? So you have, oh, this is the spirit of my spear, right? This is the spirit of my home, the spirit of this tree that we worship, the spirit of my car, you know? And on the bad day, it makes my tire pop, you know. So there's, there's spirits attached to everything. That's what they think, right? Man is a creation of the gods, like the rest of the creatures on earth. 
And oftentimes, the gods will manipulate you as a person to do what they want. So that's why you have to keep making them just complacent, right? You need to keep them happy. So you bring them food, you know? There's an altar. You, you make sacrifices on the altar. You want them happy, you know? You want to feed the idols because a fed idol is a happy idol. Because if the idol, if your god is hangry, you know, hungry, angry, that's a bad day for everybody. You don't want your god to be hangry. So you keep feeding them in these spirits, and you try to keep them happy. Moral values take the form of taboos, meaning don't do this because it's going to make this God angry. Don't do that, you know? Sacrifice the chicken for this God, but don't do this for that God. Give this guy corn. And it becomes this mess of just whatever feels right. This is a very scary, scary place to be. You live a life in fear. That's if naturalism and atheism leads to despair, deism leads to fear. You will remember when Paul, the apostle, walks into Athens and he was walking around and looking at all these temples to all these different gods that they were trying to appease, spending just tons of gold and money and making all these temples. He says, he walks around and sees all these altars and he says, I even found an altar to an unknown god. You guys are so afraid of angering some invisible spirits. You guys built an altar for some God you guys didn't even know about. Just in case there's some God out there that we, hey, man, we're going to sacrifice something for you too. You know, just don't hurt us. Don't strike us down with the lightning bolt. It's a funny situation because gods are really viewed as just their own. You think about Zeus and Athena and all these things, right? They're having their own, you know, they're hashing out things. They're at war, and humans are just kind of caught in the middle of all this. That's what deism is all about. You live a life of fear. Pantheism. Pantheism is, uh, includes religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, New Age religions. What they talk about is that only the spiritual exists, everything is a part of God, and it really, it's not God, it's this life force this, that leads, and it's part of nature. Man is just a part of reality. You're not an individual, but you're just a piece of this reality and the spiritual thing. It's just kind of a soup and a mess. You're not really sure what's, but it's all positive, and it just kind of moves you forward, right? Um, there's really no difference between good and evil. It's just, just a part of reality. Everything's just, it is what it is. There is only this life force that you have to connect with, right? So if you listen to Oprah Winfrey, any fans here? <laughs> Peter's a fan of Oprah. Is, did, you, did she give you something free? Is that what's going on? Okay. Everybody gets a car, you know? It's, that's what it's about, just this positiveness. Guys, just do the right thing, you know? Just, it's, it's about moving. Just, it's, we're all part of this together, There's this human experience, you know? That's what it's all about, this pantheism. You're just a part of everything, Hinduism. Just be a part, just figure it out inside of you. Just find inner peace with it. Find inner peace. And here's what happens. If there is no God who lays down the moral law and tells you what is good and evil, then when evil happens, you really can't say anything about it because it's just, it, it is what it is. When cancer happens, you say, well, it's a part of, it is what it is. It's a part of the way the world is made. When injustice happens, a woman gets raped, a man gets murdered, well, it is what it is. There is no God to say what is right or what is wrong. You have no hope of meeting God after you die. There is nobody, there is no savior it is what it is. There is hopelessness and you are lost and you just have to make peace with it and meditate about it and hope you're happy with what the current situation is because you can't change it and there is no God to help you. Naturalism leads to despair. Deism leads to fear. Pantheism leads to hopelessness. Leads to hopelessness. Next there is theism. Theism is Judaism, uh, Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses, all of that kind of lumped into that because they do believe that there is a God. They believe that God created the world. They believe that God created us, mankind. They believe that God does set moral values. He says what is right and what is wrong. And then that's it. So you now, knowing what is right and what is wrong, need to abide by those values. So if you're a Muslim, 
you better pray five times a day. Because if you don't, you're going to hell. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you better live the perfect life. If you're a, a, a Jew or a follower of Judaism, you better follow the commandments and, and, and all that's in the Old Testament and the Torah and everything that's associated. You've got to live that life. You've got to be a good person. Because that's what God said. He laid it down, you know, right from wrong. You have to follow it. Now, that leads to two things. It's just about religion, right? Right? There is no savior, there is no hope, and um, it leads to either a state of judgmentalism inside of us, is is that a word, judgment maybe, where you think, well, I follow all the rules, you know, look at me, I've done it all. You people are sinners, you guys don't follow the rules, right? Right? It leads to all the, you know, I love Mark Driscoll, he spoke on the subject, he says, it leads to funny hats, you know? If you're a Muslim, you got to wear the one hat. If you're a Jew, you got to wear the other hat, you know? If you're, you know, I grew up in Amish country, you got to wear something else, right? Um, if you don't, you know, you got to cover up pants or shorts. Yeah, I don't know. You got to figure it out. You know, every church, is, it leads to rules and rules and rules and rules. You've got to wear a suit in this thing, you know? You go to an Orthodox church, you've got to wear something else, you know? Why has he got a big hat? Because he's a big guy. Why has he got a little hat? Because he's a little guy, right? So that's what it leads to. And I, I love Mark's take on this because it's so, so accurate. That's what it, it's about religion. It's about the rules. So religion leads to judgment and judging people. You guys know that. We talked about that. But it also leads to um, exhaustion. Because think about you as a normal person. And, all right, maybe I'll do the Muslim thing, but, man, they've got so many rules, and you got to do all this stuff, and, man, if you don't agree with me, i got to kill you. Ah, That's exhausting, and I don't want to go to jail. (laughs) Maybe I'll do Judaism, but they've got the Torah, and it's so much there. I don't know. Maybe I'll do Jehovah's Witness, but, man, they've got a lot of rules there, too, and you're just running around and trying to do all these rules, and you're exhausted, and so you come home every night, and you think, all right, what did I do bad today? And if you do anything bad, God punishes you. So now God becomes this figure in heaven who looks down at you, and all he's doing is sending lightning bolts at you, right, in the form of, man, now you got cancer. God, what did I, oh, man, I messed up again. Man, I failed my exam. Ah, oh, Jesus, what did I do wrong? So you're, you're running away from a judging God who hates you, who's always looking at you. He's a stern judge. And you really, you, you got to follow the rules. Everything you do bad, he will punish you and punish you and punish you and punish you. And it's just exhausting. I mean, how much more? I'm only 21 and I've got so much life left. Oh, it's, it's exhausting. And then when finally you reach, you think you're a good person, you just become a hypocrite. How about that? That's what religion leads to. You either become a judging hypocrite or you just get exhausted. And then there's Christianity. Here's what Christianity says, guys. Listen up close because this is the message. This is the gospel. There is a God in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. He created man. He created man perfectly, but man fell The first man and woman sinned, and that sin is now in their genes, and their genes are passed down to all of their descendants. That's us. God is perfect. He laid down the perfect law, what is right and what is wrong. It is not subjective. It is objective. There is only one truth, and there is everything else. Now, he says all of us have a future and a hope if you follow the rules, right? If you live a perfect life, You can get into heaven, but guess what? We're not perfect. I don't care what Dr. Phil told you, all right? You're special and unique snowflakes. Each one of you are just, no. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have no hope except death. Sinning is what we call when we fall short of the rules of God. God says you must do this, and we, none of us, can do that. 
If you sin once, you are a sinner, right? If you lie once, you are a liar. If you steal once, you are a thief. Therefore, none of us can be perfect. You sin once, that's it. You're not perfect anymore because perfection requires 100% perfection. And the punishment of sin is death. And God, being a just God, can't just let you go. He can't say, hey, it's cool, man. I'm not going to, you know, I didn't see that. I didn't see that. Because a just God will punish justly. Imagine if he let a murderer go. If somebody came in, murdered your family, and the judge said, it's all good, man. We're buddies. You would be furious. You would say, where's the justice? There's, this is injustice. This is not fair. So God can't do that. We all must be punished. We all must receive death. But God is not only a just God and a judging God, but he is a loving God. And in order for your judgment to be executed, he sends his one and only son, who is also God, who is a part of him, but is also a being that is separate. And he sends him down, and he punishes him for every single sin created from the beginning of time to the end of time. All of that he puts on his son. And he says, you will pay the price for all of these people. And now we have a savior. Christianity is about the good news, that all of us have fallen short, but we have a savior And that is why when we do evil, when we do sin, when we screw up, we make a mistake, something happens in our life, we lose control. We don't run away from God because he's going to punish us, but we run to God and say, Father, you've already punished your son for me. He has received the full punishment. I just begged for forgiveness because all he wants you to do is say, accept this, accept this payment. When you come to court and you know that your fine is Paid for, all you have to do is say, all right, I accept that my fine is paid for. He says, accept me into your life. Accept the death of my son. Devote your life to me. That's all I require. Just live a life that shows that you love me. Be thankful, accept, change your life, and sin no more. And if you do sin, come back. I'll, I'll, I'll forgive you. But let's live that life of a relationship where I know you. Man, it's so simple, right? And yet millions and millions and billions of people keep running away from God, running away from the Savior to all these other worldviews, to despair, to hopelessness, to fear, to religion, to hypocrisy. God says, man, I don't get it. You have a savior. You have a savior. You have a God that loves you. I hope that kind of lays it out for you guys because as Christians, we believe in a certain type of God. Now, it comes to the next question of, all right, we know that we have a God. We know we have a God that loves us. um, But now comes the question of, all right, prove it to me. You know, we've talked about all these religions. Is there a God? Can you show me proof? Can you show me God? And you say, all right, well, can you show me the Big Bang? And they're going to say, no, but I can show you evidence of the Big Bang. And you say, well, I can show you evidence of God. My thought today is this. It's very simple. If God created the earth and the universe, in fact, out of things that are invisible right? Could he not also himself be made of what is invisible? Could he not also be greater than that? I mean, here's the idea, folks. We try to fit this huge idea of God, right? God is not the size of the stage. He's bigger than the universe. And we try to fit this idea of God as people here, tiny, minuscule in the whole scale of things. We try to fit the idea of God into our minds. And if we can't understand it, then he must not exist, it reminds me of a story of a man uh, um, that was just fishing off a bridge, and he would catch the fish, and he would measure it, and all the little ones he would keep, and all the big ones he would throw back in the water, and somebody was watching this guy, and he comes up to him, and like, bro, you are so dumb, for real. Oh, 
You guys know the reference? <laughs> Why are you throwing away the big fish? Just keep some of the bigger fish and you'll, you'll have more food quicker. And he says, no, 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 that's not the reason. He says, my frying pan at home was only eight inches. I measure the fish, and if they fit on my frying pan, I keep them, and the big ones I throw back in the water. All right? We're like the guys that are sitting there fishing for God and trying to understand him, and we catch a shark, we catch a freaking whale, and we're like, oh, it's too big for our frying pan. Throw it back in the water. It's just we can't, we can't accept it. We can't fit it in our minds. We don't understand it. Let me give you another illustration here. You guys know Job from the Bible? Most of you guys do, okay? Uh, I recommend reading that book. <laughs> if you have a Bible, it's amazing. But Job is a man um, living in the Middle East. And, you know, this, we're talking about ancient history. And the Bible has a story about him where he, you know, he's going through this tough time that God allowed Satan to put in his life where he lost his family, he's lost all that he had, he's sick with leprosy, this terrible disease, and he's sitting there by this dumpster pile, uh, you know, and his friends come to try to comfort him, and all they do is judge him. So he's in a really tough spot, right? And finally, he kind of breaks down and says, God, I didn't really do anything bad. I'm not sure why this is happening to me. I want to speak with you. And God comes to him and begins to speak to him, and he says, hey, have you seen the clouds? Do you know how you know, rain is made? And Job says, man, no, I, I don't. <laughs> you have to remember in those times, they didn't, you know, they didn't know the water cycle like we did, right? And then he says another simple question. All right, have you ever been to the depths of the ocean? Now, you have to understand something here. For us, it's like, yeah, I know. You know I've seen the anglerfish. You know, I've seen that. They didn't have scuba gear in the time of Job. So to them, anything deeper than like 12 feet, if you couldn't dive deeper than that, it was just mystery. You did not know what was out there in the ocean. You know, what monsters lurked under the, in the depths of the sea. It was a mystery to you. You really had no clue. It was scary. So Job says, man, I, I don't, I really don't know what's going on out there. So I'll put it into the words of modern day people, right? If God came to you, to, you, we know what's at the ocean, we know all that stuff, right? But if God came to Job today, if he came to you today, I would imagine he would say, hey, do you know what dark matter is made of? Serge, you don't have to answer that question if you know that. <laughs> but he's a physicist. Uh, but he would come, do you know what the Higgs, is it Boston, bassoon, whatever, but what, the, what, what are quarks made of? Do you know what happens on the edge of the universe? And we would say, no, I don't, man. I, I really don't know. It's a mystery to us. We don't know. And he says, well, guess what? I do. I am out there. I made that. It's all my realm. I, I, I'm bigger than all that. Here's a very cool... Um, a very cool observation is that the Bible never tries to prove to you that God exists. Do you guys ever notice that? There's never like this argument that, well, if, if this happened and this happened, and then God must exist. I love that we begin to read the Bible, and instead of saying, let me prove to you that there is a God, it says, hey, in the beginning, God. It just states it as a fact. I don't, you know, prove whatever you want for yourself, but there is God. He was here from the beginning. In the beginning, God. God never tries to prove himself. And in fact, in Hebrews 11.1, 1, 1, uh, 11, 1, he says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. I love it, man. So much science in that little verse. He says, God made things that we see out of things that are not seen. Right? Simple. So, therefore, he can also be something that is invisible, which means you have to accept it by faith. He's a whale. You can't fit him on your frying pan. Accept it and move on and believe. Now, that being said, I do want to give you a couple. I'm going to give you five proofs uh, in very, very brief form for the existence of God. So that we could all say, God is real. God happens. He, he moves among us, okay? And so, five arg arguments for God's existence. First of all, 
the concept of God. Thank you, gentlemen. The concept of God. The concept of God says this. All of us, no matter what race, what religion, where you grew up, anywhere, you have in your heart an idea that there might be a God. It's really crazy. You find just these tribes in the woods, and they have deist systems. They have gods. None of them are like, what? There's a, God. There's a higher being? All of them, for whatever reason, every human on earth has a feeling that maybe there's something more. And that comes right in line with the Bible of Romans chapter 1. We read a a verse where he says, uh, what has been made known to them. God says, I will judge everybody because I have made known to them in their heart that there is a God. Every single person on earth. For whatever reason, we continue to discover new tribes and every single one of them has a concept of that there is a God. Some sort of God, maybe it's spirits, maybe it's something else, but everybody does. Hmm. Maybe because there's a God. I don't know. Two, the origin of matter. Um, One thing about this universe that we live in is that it has kind of a law of cause and effect, if I could put it that way. If I tip over the stand, it didn't tip over by itself, something caused it. And take that all the way back. You guys are here because something caused you, right? Your parents are here because something caused them. Take all the way back. We're not going to go into details here, right? But everything is here because it was caused. Even things that we don't understand, maybe in the, on the atomic level, and all the particle level, we don't understand how it's caused, but we need to understand, yeah, it's, it came from somewhere. Somehow it appeared. Something happened there. That's why we keep searching and expanding our sciences, because we try to figure out, all right, well, what caused this? We, we know what's going on, but what caused it? What, and we keep getting more and more scientific material on that. So here's what happens. If this whole universe was caused, what was the cause? If we take every single thing that happened and take it back to its origin, what was the source of all of this, because there has to be something if everything is caused. What was the source of everything that is in existence, and how did it come about? Folks, God is the only entity that is uncaused. He did not have a beginning. He did not cause himself. Let me be very, very clear. God always was, always will be. He is above this world that has a rule of cause and effect. He doesn't follow that law. He is over and beyond that. He always will be. He is all-powerful, almighty, all-seeing, all of those things. God, we, we serve an incredible God that is above all of this. There is no cause and effect for him. He didn't cause himself. Nobody caused him. He causes everything. That is the God we serve. He is perfect. He is sovereign. He is powerful. He is no source because he is the source of everything. Next, the evidence of design. Our world is very, very complex. And within all of this complexity, there is a lot of order and logic. Now, this goes against a lot of the main scientific principles today because they talk about entropy, which means everything eventually becomes a mush. It doesn't get more organized, it gets less organized. But for some reason, we have Earth that is getting more and more organized. People are becoming, you know, more advanced. Even where technology is developing, something's going on here that doesn't abide by the regular rules. There is design to all of this. There is thought. Folks, if I take a box of this toothpicks and I throw a firecracker in there, it's not going to... And build me like a little toothpick bridge, okay? Doesn't happen. It, it'll deteriorate. But yet there's something here that causes things, instead of deteriorating, to form, to happen, to grow better, to become sort of logical. It's really crazy. Albert Einstein, you guys ever heard of him? Crazy hair, smart guy. He comes into a dinner party once. And uh, they presumed that he was an atheist and said, you know, what do you think of this funny notion of God? And he says, no, I actually believe that there is a God. And the people were shocked, like, what? Albert Einstein, you're a smart dude. He says, no, as I study physics, as I study this world, the science world, 
He says, I come into it like I'm going into a library. And when you go into a library, everything is nice and organized. I know you guys don't go into libraries anymore. It's about Wikipedia and stuff. But imagine like Wikipedia, but in real life, right? So he says, I look around, and it's, it's, everything is organized by sections, by numbers, by authors. Everything is put in order. He says, that tells me that somebody put it in order. It doesn't just get up there by itself. So he says, when I enter into the scientific world, when I begin to study it, and I see that everything is just perfectly arranged, and these laws are so beautiful, E equals MC squared, so short, but it's the same, and it's the basis of everything we study. This is incredible. There must be a designer. There must be evidence. There is evidence of design. Next, the uniqueness of humans. Humans differ from every other creation, folks. Our brains look the same as the brains of anything. A dolphin, you take a dolphin, our brains look very, very identical. But for some reason, we have morals, we have values, we have structure, we develop, we invent things that no other creature in this world can do. For some reason, we are just situated just like the Bible says. He put him above all creation. We are different from anything else in this world. We have thoughts, we have feelings, we have emotions, we have an understanding of self, self-consciousness. And it's just weird and it's an unnatural phenomenon that again points to there being a higher being, to there being a God. It's really funny that a lot of scientists, even atheists, uh, other than the really extreme ones, will tell you, you know what, there may be a possibility for a God. There may be something out there. There may be a super intelligent being out there that we don't know and we can't measure. We can't discount that completely. We really can't. I think they're one step closer to becoming believers. I want to get him in here and speak to them because there is a God. And last, the resurrection of Christ. I love it because it, um, one, the resurrection of Jesus is the center of all we believe in. I love it because it's just been Easter a little bit ago. But here's how I'm going to explain this to you. It's going to be in the words of Charles Colston, who was involved in the Watergate scandal. Now, those of you guys that flunked history, let me explain. Um, Watergate was when President Nixon uh, was, uh, I'm going off of what I remember from history. <laughs> hey, C's get degrees. Um, but... When Nixon was uh, trying to become, running for president, I think for his second or third term, I can't remember what it was. It was second term, right? So he uh, didn't feel like he was going to win. He needed a competitive edge. He sent some of his uh, aides and friends to go and raid the office of his, uh, the guy that he was running against to try to get some competitive intelligence. Um, and basically, pretty much the whole thing got blown up pretty soon. People found out about it. Um, and Charles Colston was one of the guys that was out there and doing all of this. He was one of Nixon's closest aides. He went to jail for what was done. He came out of jail a believer. And he says this, man. Listen to the words of a very, very intelligent man. I'm going to read this to you guys, but listen, listen closely. I love this. When Charles Colston, one time Watergate criminal turned founder of the Prison Fellowship, is challenged about the truth of Christ's resurrection. He responds, my answer is always that the disciples and the 500 other witnesses, witness accounts of seeing Jesus risen from the tomb. When I'm asked, how do you know that they were telling the truth? So how do you know that all these witnesses and people that wrote in the Bible were telling the truth that Christ rose from the dead? Maybe some of them were perpetrating a hoax. Maybe some of them were lying. Colson says, my answer to that comes back to an unlikely source, Watergate. He says, listen to this, when Watergate involved a conspiracy perpetuated by the closest aides of the President of the United States, his closest friends, the most powerful man in America, and they were intensely loyal to their president. But one of them, John Dean, turned state's evidence, meaning he gave up and told everybody everything. Uh, he testified against Nixon's, as he put it, to save his own skin. And he did so only Two weeks after informing the president about what was really going on, the cover-up, the lie could only be held together for two weeks, and then everybody else jumped ship to save themselves. Not all those around the president, not, now all those around the president were facing embarrassment, maybe prison, nobody's life was at stake. So he's saying, hey, during Watergate, 
These guys didn't want to be embarrassed. So two weeks after all of this happened, they said, oh man, I, yeah, I don't want this to go public. So they all gave themselves up and said, hey, it was all a hoax. Here's what we did. Here's the deal. And Charles Colson says, now, what about the disciples? Twelve men. Powerless. Some were fishermen. So, I mean, just uneducated guys, you know. Tax collector here. Some, you know, uh, other guys there. Zealots. He says, just random dudes from, you know, Israel. They weren't just facing embarrassment. It wasn't like somebody was going to embarrass them and say, ah, you know, we've discovered that you guys stole the body of Christ. It wasn't like that. Remember, they were stoned. They were beaten. They were crucified. They were boiled alive. John the Baptist boiled, you know, utility. All of that, Peter hung upside down, nails torn out. They were skinned alive. Christians were hung on crosses and set on fire in Nero's gardens in order to light the parties that he had there. Can you believe that? That wasn't just being embarrassed. But yet, not a single one of them recanted. Not a single one of them said, all right, all right, don't burn me. It was a hoax. Jesus, oh, we stole the body. Here it is. Not a single one of them. All of them went to their grave. All of them went to a torturous death all the way to the end. And each one of them said till the last breath that they had said, no, Jesus was alive. We saw him in the flesh after he was resurrected. It's truth. It's truth. We know that he is God. God is real. Not one of them. Gave up. Man. You know why you can go through all that and keep saying God is real? Because God is real. If you met and you walked with Jesus, if you knew that he was God, you would go to your death saying that he was real. No matter how torturous, how bad, you would say, God is real. I quote Charles Colson again. No, you can take it from an expert in cover-ups. I've lived through Watergate. That nothing less than a resurrected Christ could have caused those men to maintain to their dying whispers that Jesus is alive and is Lord. 2,000 years later, nothing less than the power of the risen Christ could inspire Christians around the world to remain faithful despite prison, torture, and death. That's happening right now, folks. Just this last week, another video comes up of the ISIS members uh, just gunning down more and more Christians, and each one of them goes to their death and says, no, God is real. That's the thrilling message of Easter. It's a historic fact, one convincingly established by the evidence, and one you can bet your life upon. At the end of the day, folks, it's between you and God. At the end of the day, it's just between you and God, folks. It's your life will show, will be the proof of what kind of God you believe in. If I could ask the band, you guys can come up, but I'm going to ask you guys a couple of questions right now. If somebody, if an unbeliever walked in today and sat in our rows, you know, and maybe you are an unbeliever today that's sitting here, welcome, we love you, man, thanks for coming out. But I would wonder if I took you and I ask you to, after this uh, you know, little thing we've got here, and I ask you to write down and say, tell me what you think God is like. And you looked around and you said, well, I think God likes pews. I think he likes big buildings. I think he likes it when we sing karaoke together and drink coffee afterwards, right? Or if I asked an unbeliever today to look at your life and your daily living from morning to evening, your whole week, would they look at you and say, well, God um, really doesn't help his people much, man. They, they, they don't really trust him. I, don't think he's, I think he's powerless because they don't turn to him. I think he's, he's, maybe he doesn't even exist because they don't pray to him at all. Their prayer is when they go to bed, they kind of cuddle up under their covers. Oh, I forgot to pray. God, just let me sleep well. Amen. And that's all of our, that's their whole spiritual life. If, our if an unbeliever looked at us today, if somebody who is still new to this concept of God and whether he's real and he looked at your life, would he see God working in your life? 
Will he see that you believe that God is real? Folks, it's between you and God right now. Because some of us pay it lip service when we say, yeah, God's real. But there is no sign of him in your life. There is no miracles. You don't turn to him. You only turn to him when things are bad. You don't praise him when things are good. And worst of all, you don't trust him. You don't think the Savior can save you because you live in despair. You don't think there's a Savior because you live in fear. Maybe you're judgmental. You live a life of hypocrisy where all you do is do law, 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 but there's no grace. Or maybe tonight you're just exhausted. You're just exhausted because you just do and do and do all these rules and God keeps pursuing you because you believe he's a judging God. Can we all stand together? If tonight you want to meet the real God, you have that opportunity. Man, we've got all these folks with tags on them. They'd love to pray with you. You guys can come out front. I'll pray with you. Peter will pray with you. You can just raise your hand and somebody will come up to you and pray. I would love that as well. But folks, this is a decision, okay? You either believe that God is real or you walk out of here, might as well just be an atheist, guys. Just live for yourself. Believe you're just a collection of atoms. There is no existence of God. There is no meaning to life. Live a life of despair, of fear, of hopelessness. I'll pray and then we'll worship together. Father, it's so good to know that you are here. You say when we gather two or three around your name, you are here, and we know this is we're specifically gathered here for you and for your name, Lord. God, I pray you speak into every single heart. A God that is real moves in our lives. A God that is real changes lives. A God that is real saves lives. You give hope, you give peace, you give comfort, Father. And so many people here tonight may be just exhausted. They may be despairing, not trusting you in life and the issues that are going on in their lives, Father. Let us all just come back to you. Come back to your reality, the concrete truth that you are powerful, you are sovereign, you are endless, you are endlessly loving. And you are here tonight. Jesus, thank you. Bless us with your presence. And anybody here that may want to come to you, Father, just bless them and give them that courage. And all the rest of us that don't live with that truth permanently in our heart, Father, renew us with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen.